We're excited to have Dr. Juan Latora give today's lecture. Dr. Latora received his medical degree from the National University of the Northeast in Argentina and received a PhD in pharmacology from Tulane University. Dr. Latora is currently an adjunct professor of medicine at Duke University and Louisiana State University. Previously, Dr. Latora was a faculty member at the Clinical Pharmacology Center, Northwestern University. Between 1981 and 2006, he was professor of medicine and pharmacology at Tulane University School of Medicine. Dr. Latour joined the NIH Clinical Center in 2006 as the director of clinical pharmacology program and led this course, The Principles of Clinical Pharmacology, until his retirement from the NIH in 2016. Please enjoy the presentation. Welcome to Principles of Clinical Pharmacology. Uh, my name is Juan Lertora, and today I will present an overview of the discipline of clinical pharmacology, and I also will introduce the basic concepts in pharmacokinetics and its clinical applications. The focus of the course traditionally has been on the scientific basis of drug use, development, and evaluation. We do not consider this to be a course in therapeutics, but of course there will be relevant examples uh, of applications of clinical pharmacology in, in therapeutics. Uh, we will discuss general principles that are applicable to both old and new drugs. Uh, there is a textbook uh, that has been used for this course for a number of years, uh, Principles of Clinical Pharmacology. The lead editor is Dr. Arthur J. Atkinson, Jr. So, uh, let us see an outline of what I would like uh, to cover for you today. Uh, in the first part, uh, we will have an overview uh, addressing the general scope of the discipline, uh, some uh, brief historical notes. Uh, we will talk about what do clinical pharmacologists engage in as professionals. We will emphasize the topic of variability in drug response as an area of great interest uh, in our field. Uh, also, adverse drug reactions and their impact both in terms of drug development and clinical use of drugs. And finally, a, a brief overview of drug development. So let's uh, move on then and define pharmacology as the study of drugs and biologics and their actions in living organisms. Uh, generally, when we talk about drugs, we think of small molecules, chemical agents. Uh, when we talk about biologics, we're thinking about large molecules, uh, peptides, and uh, antibodies. The most basic definition of our field is that clinical pharmacology is the study of drugs and biologics in humans. The discipline really spans the spectrum of drug discovery, drug development, drug utilization, and drug regulation. We aim in clinical pharmacology, we aim at advancing therapeutics in humans with mechanistic understanding of drug actions. This is an area term pharmacodynamics and also drug disposition. And that is, of course, the subject of uh, pharmacokinetics. Now, you know, of course, uh, the concept of translational sciences and how much it has been emphasized uh, for the last decade or so. Uh, basically, we talk about knowledge that has been acquired in animal or in silico models of disease 
or through ex vivo studies in human tissues or in vivo studies in healthy or diseased humans that then is translated into effective treatment for patients. Clinical pharmacology is a translational discipline essential for drug development and therapeutics in humans. Now a bit of history uh, focusing on the founders of American clinical pharmacology. I'm talking about Drs. Harry Gold and Dr. Walter Modell at Cornell University. And this is a partial list of their accomplishments and uh, fundamental contributions, uh, introducing the double-blind clinical trial design in 1937, uh, initiating the Cornell Conference on Therapy a couple of years later, and in the early 50s, analyzing dejoxing effect kinetics to estimate the absolute bioavailability as well as the time course of the chronotropic effects of dejoxing. Uh, we'll come back to this example later in the talk. And in 1960, they founded the journal Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics, which is today, of course, a leading journal uh, in the discipline. Now, at the NIH, uh, we should mention Dr. Albert Scherzma, who headed the experimental, experimental therapeutic branch at the National Heart Institute uh, from 1958 through 1971. <clears throat> he uh, trained uh, individuals of the stature of Lou Gillespie, John Oates, Leon Goldberg, Richard Kraut, Ken Melmon, and many others uh, that subsequently uh, became uh, leaders in the discipline as well. Their research focused on serotonin and the carcinoid syndrome, uh, pheochromocytoma, antihypertensive drugs, and, and many other uh, contributions. Now, what are the professional goals of clinical pharmacologists? Well, we are interested in the discovery, development, evaluation of new medicines and how their use is regulated by the Food and Drug Administration in the United States and other regulatory agents in other countries. We are also interested in optimizing the use of existing medicines and often finding new indications for all drugs. But as I mentioned in our initial outline, uh, a critical area of interest to clinical pharmacologists is to define the basis for variability in therapeutic and toxic responses uh, to medicine. Uh, and this is an example uh, looking at uh, the exposure to two anti-diabetic drugs, uh, pioglitazone on the left uh, side of the slide and metformin on the right hand side. And we're looking at drug exposure in terms of the area under the plasma concentration time versus time curve. And uh, this is an AUC area under the curve that has been normalized to a 15 milligram dose of pioglitazone and a 500 milligram dose of metformin uh, and also uh, normalized to 70 kilograms of body weight uh, for uh, a human uh, patient. And you see the great uh, variability that we see in drug exposure both in females and males. Uh, in the case of both of these anti-diabetic agents. So that's one of the challenges clinical pharmacologists uh, face uh, in trying to understand the basis for this variability in drug exposure and how it may impact on the uh, therapeutic uh, actions uh, of the drug. Another source of variability in drug exposure 
may relate to underlying genetic variants. In this instance, we are using the example of nortriptyline, uh, a, a tricyclic antidepressant that has been in use for many years, and the impact of cytochrome P452D6 polymorphism. And uh, here we are plotting plasma concentration of nortriptyline after a 25 milligram dose uh, over time. And then we see the impact of the number of functional genes for CYP2D6. Uh, the first curve on top uh, indicates a higher exposure for an individual that does not express uh, CYP2D6 and uh, actually, uh, by definition, is a very slow metabolizer of this drug. And then the uh, progressively uh, smaller area under the curve with increasing numbers of CYP2D6 functional genes. This over here uh, at the bottom uh, is an individual with 13 copies of the gene that uh, is uh, also an ultra rapid metabolizer of this drug. So another source of variation in drug exposure and of course potentially on therapeutic uh, efficacy of drugs uh, uh, in terms of this uh, pharmacogenetically determined uh, variation in drug exposure. Now let's turn to another major area of interest in clinical pharmacology, namely uh, adverse uh, drug reaction. Some toxicities of drugs can be managed and may be acceptable based on a risk-benefit ratio, but other uh, adverse reactions and toxicities by their nature and severity are really unacceptable and those drugs uh, either have to be removed from clinical use or used with great caution and adherence to uh, significant uh, uh, and close monitoring of the patients. Uh, we need to understand of course that risk benefit is contextual depending on the drug and the disease that we intend to treat. Uh, it is not the same uh, to consider uh, potentially serious toxicity for a drug intended to treat hypertension, uh, which is a condition that needs lifelong uh, therapy, uh, compared to, say, uh, treatment of cancer, uh, a disease that is potentially lethal over the short term and that requires uh, very intense treatment with combination of drugs that have very significant uh, toxicity. So again, risk benefit is contextual uh, and we must consider the drug in question and the disease that we uh, are uh, intending to treat. Uh, uh, now again, in terms of genetics, uh, as it may relate to severe drug toxicity. Now this is uh, uh, a condition or situations, if you will, where an underlying genetic variant may predispose individuals to severe toxicity from drugs. Uh, here we have the examples of HLA B5701, uh, individuals that carry this HLA variant are at very high risk of abacavir hypersensitivity. Abacavir is a drug uh, used in the treatment of HIV infection and AIDS and uh, prior to instituting treatment with abacavir, every patient is first tested for this variant uh, HLA B5701. If they have the variant, they cannot be treated with that drug and an alternative must be found. Uh, the next example that we show here is that of HLA-B1502 uh, predisposing to severe uh, carbamazepine-induced Stevens-Johnson syndrome. This is a serious cutaneous adverse drug reaction uh, that actually can be fatal. So uh, once again, 
the uh, underlying genetic variants uh, conferring uh, predisposition to severe uh, drug uh, toxicity. Another example of unacceptable drug toxicity is that of torsade de points. What we're showing here is an electrocardiographic uh, uh, record uh, of heart rhythm in a patient that suffered uh, from an episode of this uh, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. This is a very abnormal rhythm. Uh, you can see here a normal beat, if you will, uh, in the electrocardiogram preceding these runs of polymorphic uh, uh, ventricular tachycardia that is actually drug-induced. So this is another example of a potentially life-threatening uh, adverse reaction from drugs. And uh, here I'm showing terfenidine, which historically was uh, the first non-sedating antihistamine that was uh, introduced uh, in the United States uh, market uh, under the brand name of Seldane, but was subsequently withdrawn from the market because of the risk of drug-induced uh, arrhythmias. Now, look at the metabolic transformation of terfenidine uh, in humans and the production of terfenidine carboxylate as a metabolite. Very interestingly, this metabolite is active. It also has this antihistamine uh, pharmacological action uh, and it's also a non-sedating antihistamine, but terfenidine, which is marketed as Allegra, does not have the risk of a drug-induced arrhythmia like Torsat the point. And this again uh, brings us to consider and remember the importance of studying drug metabolism and assessing whether metabolites are also pharmacologically active or are otherwise uh, inactive uh, once biotransformation has taken place. Uh, let me uh, bring you the example of thalidomide. Uh, again, in terms of uh, unacceptable drug toxicities, uh, but actually with a very interesting history as I will show you in a moment. Uh, thalidomide was introduced in the 1960s as a sedative and actually was prescribed as an anti-nausea medication to pregnant women. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, in many countries, although not in the U.S. because uh, uh, thalidomide was not approved in the United States and actually was not allowed to enter the market at the time because of the discovery of some severe uh, toxicity to uh, uh, unborn children due to prenatal drug exposure. Uh, this led to an epidemic worldwide of phocomilia, uh, children born with severe defects in terms of their limbs and, and of course, this is a, a very uh, uh, unfortunate outcome of the use of that drug in pregnant women. Uh, now, there were consequences to this thalidomide crisis. Uh, for one thing, the uh, uh, United States Congress approved the Kefauver Harris Amendments in 1962 that instituted new and more strict FDA regulations to establish whether drugs were, on the one hand, effective but uh, safe. And, and uh, the process that uh, uh, has been modernized over the years, but again, emphasizing safety and demonstrating efficacy of drugs before they're allowed uh, into the market. The Institute of Medicine and the National Academy of Sciences began to review therapeutic claims at that time. And uh, also, more research on the causes of adverse drug reactions uh, was encouraged. And the National Institute of General Medical Sciences created a number of clinical pharmacology centers in the United States to uh, 
uh, again, uh, implement uh, rational drug development uh, to establish the scientific basis of drug use uh, in, in clinical medicine. And uh, 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 again, sadly, uh, as a consequence of this major uh, thalidomide uh, crisis. So, our discipline is eminently uh, involved in the development and evaluation of new drugs. Uh, we start with drug discovery, and this is a process in itself uh, that we will be addressing in detail in another session of this course. Uh, then we have preclinical, uh, meaning uh, animal testing uh, of candidate drugs, and eventually clinical evaluation uh, to demonstrate safety in humans and uh, whether or not the drug is effective in a given uh, clinical condition. Uh, but then we also have post-marketing studies. Uh, once the drug enters the market, we continue to evaluate uh, for the possibility of rare adverse drug reactions that were not discovered uh, in the uh, pre-approval uh, uh, stage and also uh, performing studies in special populations like the elderly and, and in, in children. Now, this is a schematic of pre-marketing drug development. Uh, you see here the phase of preclinical development. Uh, we have animal models, we have assay development, we study pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics in animals. We, of course, uh, begin to study animal toxicology in the short term and the long term if the drug is intended for chronic use. And once uh, a package of information is developed that indicates that the candidate drug may in fact be promising, uh, an investigation of new drug application, the IND, is filed with the Food and Drug Administration or other regulatory agencies. And then we begin the process of evaluating drugs in humans, uh, typically considered as uh, phase one, first dose in human studies, dose escalations to assess uh, tolerance. Uh, phase two, when we do the proof of concept studies, uh, treating patients with a condition that may benefit uh, potentially from the drugs. And phase three, the large, uh, uh, randomized uh, clinical trials comparing the new drug to a placebo or to uh, a previously uh, established uh, therapy. Uh, and that then leads to the submission of a new drug application or NDA uh, where the sponsor uh, asks the regulatory agents to review this body of evidence and request approval for marketing the drug and to begin uh, uh, using the drug in clinical practice. Uh, one way to look at the phases of drug development is with the learn and confirm paradigm. Uh, the late Dr. Lou Shiner and his colleagues uh, advocated this approach. Uh, phase one and phase two are the learning phases of drug development. Phase three is the confirm confirmatory phase, and phase four again is the post-marketing phase, but learning continues, uh, focusing on rare adverse drug reactions and special populations if required. Now let's talk for a moment about drug repurposing. Uh, this is an area where the National Institutes of Health and, and uh, other uh, academic investigators uh, have been very interested in, uh, and that has to do with finding new biological targets and new therapeutic indications for all drugs. Uh, what are the potential advantages of this approach? Well, for one thing, it may shorten drug development time. Uh, we already know a lot about the safety of the drug and we also have data in terms of the human 
pharmacokinetic behavior of the drug. And uh, uh, drug repurposing then, and this is the concept of, of Dr. Austin at NCATS, uh, is uh, illustrated uh, in this fashion. Now, typically we have a process of drug screening of uh, thousands of compounds and the whole process may take 10 years uh, between uh, identifying uh, the target agent and performing all the preclinical and clinical uh, phases of drug development uh, that may then lead to drug approval. Uh, what if then through repurposing of a much smaller uh, number of drugs that have been in use for other indications uh, uh, could uh, perhaps uh, shorten the period of drug development to a couple of years. Now this is ideal but conceptually uh, again very important. And we do have examples of a number of drugs that have been repurposed and uh, very interestingly we have again thalidomide extremely toxic and forbidden uh, in uh, pregnant females. But nevertheless, through the uh, clinical observation of a physician in the 1960s, uh, it became a very useful agent to lead, or rather to treat, a complication of leprosy called erythema nodosum leprosum. Uh, so uh, again, uh, a drug that otherwise was banned from marketing becomes now useful in a clinical condition like erythema nodosum leprosum. Uh, years later, uh, the drug was actually studied in the condition of multiple myeloma, uh, again a form of cancer, uh, this time uh, through targeted drug development. Uh, in any case, these are now two FDA approved indications. This is an immunomodulatory agent. Marketing is done under a very special and very restricted distribution program uh, referred to as System for Thalidomide Education and Prescribing. Uh, but uh, a very good example of drug repurposing. And uh, in this slide I show you a list of drugs that were uh, approved originally for a different indication uh, but now are FDA approved for indications uh, that uh, for example for sildenafil uh, include uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, lamotrigine being used for bipolar disorder and, and so forth. So again repurposing as a viable and, and potentially uh, very important uh, way to look at uh, finding uh, new uh, indications uh, for all drugs. Now, let us move to the second phase of our conversation today and uh, introduce you to the basic concepts in pharmacokinetics and its clinical applications. We will talk uh, about the apparent volume of distribution and the clearance parameters. These are two parameters that we call primary pharmacokinetic parameters. Uh, then we will address first order kinetics, uh, the vast majority of drugs that we use uh, in clinical medicine uh, follow the pattern of first order kinetics of drug elimination, uh, but there are exceptions and that would lead us to discuss uh, Michaelis mentor kinetics uh, for uh, drug elimination. So, pharmacokinetics, the quantitative analysis of the time course of drug absorption, drug distribution, drug metabolism, and excretion or elimination uh, from the body. Uh, schematically here, uh, we prescribe a dose or administer a dose of medication uh, to uh, a human subject. Uh, then we need to 
wait for the process of absorption to take place so that the drug can be carried uh, typically from the gastrointestinal tract uh, to the systemic circulation. Uh, the drug in plasma may circulate as the free drug, uh, but also may bind to plasma proteins like albumin. And, and again, you have this reversible equilibrium between drug that is free in plasma and drug that is protein bound. The extent of protein binding varies tremendously depending on the drug in question. Uh, then uh, drug elimination uh, will take place, uh, uh, but of course drug distribution from the plasma compartment uh, will take place. Uh, the drug may actually distribute to most tissues uh, and you may find uh, non-specific binding of drug to tissues, but what we're really interested in is in the distribution of the drug to its site of pharmacological action, what we call the biophase, and of course the study of receptor uh, binding, and uh, ultimately the effect of the drug uh, that we're looking for. Uh, now again, uh, drug metabolism may contribute to elimination, and renal excretion is a pathway for elimination of drug metabolites, but also uh, a significant pathway for elimination of the parent drug itself uh, if uh, the uh, biotransformation is uh, incomplete or actually does not uh, take place. And finally here, we want to measure the element of adherence. Uh, physicians prescribe medications to patients Ultimately, patients decide whether or not they will take the prescribed medication. Uh, uh, monitoring for adherence is critical in the process of drug development. If you are evaluating the efficacy of the drug, you want to know that patients are actually taking the medication as prescribed uh, before you make a statement like, the drug does not work. Well, we need to have uh, rigorous control uh, for adherence uh, in the context of uh, clinical drug development. So what are the uses of pharmacokinetics? Uh, pharmacokinetics provides the basis for rational dose selection in therapeutics. Uh, it is essential for the development and evaluation of new drugs. We need to know how drugs are absorbed, to what extent they are absorbed, uh, if given orally, uh, where does the drug distribute, and uh, again, how is the drug eliminated, and what is the rate of drug elimination. Uh, pharmacokinetics is also very important in basic studies of drug distribution in animals and humans with the use of PET scanning, positron, positron, uh, positron uh, uh, emission uh, tomography, uh, where you can actually visualize the binding of drugs to its site of action. Now, a central tenant of pharmacology is the dose response relationship. We carefully study drug exposure response relationships in order to find the right dose for a given therapeutic indication. Now exposure response of course applies to both drug efficacy and toxicity. It is important to understand the range of doses that are useful therapeutically and the range of doses and resulting plasma concentrations that may lead to toxicity uh, with the use of this drug. Now there are a number of pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic modeling approaches that have been used uh, to define uh, uh, this uh, drug exposure response relationships and you will deal with that uh, in subsequent uh, sessions of the course. Now, linked to this notion of 
the dose response relationship is the target concentration strategy that has been very useful clinically for a number of drugs. We already address the concern with individual variation in drug exposure when drugs are used in standard doses, as we saw with pioglitazone or metformin. Uh, so this approach, the target concentration strategy, attempts to individualize therapy when therapeutic and toxic ranges of drug concentrations in plasma have been established. This is important uh, to define a useful therapeutic range and then to target therapy to that range of uh, therapeutic uh, concentrations. Uh, the ultimate goal is to optimize efficacy and minimize toxicity. Now, the first description of therapeutic drug monitoring that we have on record is that of Dr. Wooth uh, using bromides and uh, uh, establishing ranges of therapeutic concentrations of bromide uh, as uh, a sedative. Uh, of course, uh, this uh, approach is now used for a number of drugs and, for example, uh, lithium carbonate uh, in bipolar disorder uh, is administered with very strict attention to the resulting uh, plasma levels of lithium uh, so that you maintain efficacy and avoid some potentially serious toxicities with the use of this agent. Uh, now, what drugs are candidates for therapeutic drug monitoring generally drugs with low therapeutic index, meaning that we can quickly move from concentrations that are therapeutic uh, into ranges of concentrations that can cause toxicity. The example of lithium is a very good example of a drug with a low therapeutic index, uh, but there are many others like digoxin and some antibiotics. Uh, but in any event, uh, that category of drugs is uh, a good category of agents for therapeutic drug monitoring. You may also be dealing with a clinical situation where you don't have, uh, 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 if you will, physiologic endpoints that you can observe uh, on an ongoing basis or biomarkers to guide the dosage. Uh, you may be dealing with patients with a seizure disorder, epilepsy, where the seizures are infrequent and, of course, undesirable. Uh, so uh, you use uh, the range of therapeutic concentrations, if you will, as your biomarker to guide dosage and hope that that would lead to a significant reduction in the frequency of seizures. Uh, we already uh, stated uh, that pharmacokinetics vary widely between individuals. So if you have a target concentration, then you can adjust doses on an individual basis. Uh, occasionally, we may uh, use uh, a measurement of plasma drug concentration to monitor adherence, uh, but there are some issues with this approach uh, as well. So let's see schematically then what happens uh, when using the uh, target concentration uh, strategy. Uh, we have uh, an estimated initial dose uh, that we administer with a target level in mind. Some drugs need a loading dose to establish a therapeutic concentration quickly. Uh, followed by maintenance dose. Other drugs, we begin uh, simply with a maintenance dose. Uh, therapy is initiated, and then we have to evaluate the patient. We need to see the response in the patient. And we may also measure a drug level. And based on this assessment, then, we may refine uh, the dose estimate, adjust the dose, and then continue on an iterative basis uh, uh, to uh, optimize uh, the uh, range of concentrations uh, that we want to maintain uh, throughout uh, therapy. 
Now, how do we choose a target level? Well, this is an empirical process uh, in terms of defining what ranges of concentrations are therapeutic and where you have minimal or no toxicity. So, <clears throat> we will have uh, the example of the joxing to address this topic of how do you define a therapeutic range of concentrations. Uh, this was a study conducted uh, in Boston by Dr. Smith and Haber uh, in patients that were being treated uh, with digoxin uh, because they had uh, either uh, congestive heart failure or uh, atrial fibrillation requiring uh, rate control. And what they saw uh, looking at uh, a group of patients that were classified as being toxic or non-toxic based on clinical characteristics and electrocardiographic characteristics without knowledge of the uh, resulting uh, digoxin levels. And this is a histogram of the distribution of uh, concentrations uh, of digoxin uh, in the patients that were non-toxic and then higher concentrations of digoxin being measure in patients that were clinically uh, toxic. So on the basis of these empirical observations, <clears throat> then a therapeutic uh, target range is proposed. Uh, in this uh, instance, 0 0.8 to 1.6 nanograms per ml of plasma. <clears throat> uh, it was considered that levels in the range of 1.6 to 3 nanograms per ml were possibly toxic and uh, patients that had levels of 3 nanograms per ml or greater were probably already uh, having uh, digoxin uh, toxicity. But uh, once again, based on uh, further evaluation of the effects of digoxin, not only on function in patients with uh, congestive heart failure, but now in terms of survival after long-term treatment uh, with digoxin. Uh, this study uh, that was published in the early 2000s, uh, uh, looking at patients uh, on therapy for congestive heart failure and uh, uh, receiving digoxin uh, throughout this period of observation that lasted 48 months and then looking at survival on the basis of the observed uh, levels of the joxing. Now there was a placebo group here uh, that you see uh, with the continuous uh, line. Uh, these patients were receiving treatment for congestive heart failure but were not receiving digoxin. Uh, as part of their regimen. And then uh, patients that were receiving digoxin uh, but now stratified based on their digoxin levels. Low levels of 0.5 to 0.8, uh, intermediate levels of 0.9 to 1.1, and high levels greater than 1.2 nanograms per ml. Now, you see that survival uh, change based on the digoxin levels and the range of digoxin levels that were measured actually at one month into the trial. One month into the trial. Uh, the better survival is actually in patients that have low digoxin uh, levels in plasma and there is a disadvantage in terms of survival for patients that continue digoxin and maintain a level or at least had a level at one month uh, after beginning the trial that exceeded 1.2 uh, nanograms per ml. So, of course, the question is, what were the digoxin levels uh, well into the trial? Uh, we don't have that data, but based on this uh, survival analysis uh, for the use of digoxin in patients with congestive heart failure, there is a new therapeutic range that has been proposed, namely 0.5 to 0.9 
nanograms per ml, much lower than w what was uh, usual in, in clinical practice. And uh, the benefits may result from inhibition of sympathetic nervous system rather than improve inotropy or improve contractility uh, of the uh, myocardium. There are limitations for the study. We already pointed that out, that no digoxin levels were done after one month in the study, uh, and considering that the observations lasted for uh, 48 uh, months. So that's how we estimate a target level. And then in the case of uh, uh, drugs that require a loading dose, and that was the practice actually with digoxin, uh, uh, we need to estimate the loading dose based on the concept of distribution volume. Distribution volume or apparent volume of distribution, a primary pharmacokinetic parameter. So let us use the example of digoxin uh, uh, once again. Here we're plotting the concentrations of digoxin in plasma. This is a logarithmic scale versus time in a linear scale. And we're showing the uh, plasma concentration versus time curve for digoxin after intravenous administration of three quarters of a milligram, single dose. This is a loading dose. And uh, now we see that the plasma concentration versus time plotted semi-logarithmically declines in a bi-exponential fashion. We refer to this as the distribution phase and then this terminal phase we call the elimination phase. Now, the modeling here is plotting the tissue concentrations of digoxin over time, uh, and we see that those tissue concentrations of digoxin rise as the plasma concentrations of digoxin are declining. Now, in order to estimate the apparent volume of distribution for digoxin, uh, one approach is that of the extrapolation method, uh, namely extrapolating from the terminal phase of this curve back to time zero <clears throat> and estimated this C sub zero or initial concentration of the drug. Now, uh, that is again one approach to uh, estimating the apparent volume of distribution. And uh, we are using what we call a single compartmental model uh, of drug distribution and elimination. We administered the dose. In our example, we gave this dose intravenously. Then we have this single body compartment, a hypothetical compartment where the drug is distributed. And then we are showing here the parameter of elimination clearance. And uh, basically, what we're doing in this example, the volume of distribution by extrapolation uh, is estimated as the ratio of the dose over that extrapolated uh, initial concentration. The assumption, of course, is that instantaneous distribution occurs. We saw that that is not the case, but once again, this is one approach that uh, has been useful uh, in terms of estimating the apparent volume of distribution. There are other approaches that you will discuss later in the course, the volume of distribution by area and the volume of distribution at steady state. So the example of the joxing, uh, initial digitalization, this is a term referring to the loading dose of, of the joxing, a quarter of a milligram being administered and that distributing into a single compartment resulting in that initial concentration of 1.4 uh, nanograms per ml. Uh, you see here we are uh, doing our proper dimensional analysis in terms of the uh, uh, dose that was administered, the measure concentration in plasma 
in terms of uh, nanograms per ml, and then applying that principle, uh, the dilution principle, if you will, uh, we have now our dose uh, in nanograms per ml, our concentration in nanograms per ml, and we have this rather large volume, apparent volume of distribution of 536 liters for digoxin. Uh, of course, this does not uh, agree with the reality of physiological body fluid compartments, but nevertheless, uh, the apparent volume of distribution is a critical and very important pharmacokinetic parameter uh, to determine. Now, let's go back uh, to the process of drug distribution. Uh, we saw that uh, distribution, in fact, was not instantaneous, and that has an impact on the action of the drug. Uh, in this case, the chronotropic action of digoxin, uh, in that digoxin, slows the heart rate. Uh, here we're looking at ventricular rate uh, in a group of patients with atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. And we have both oral and intravenous administration. This is from the classic work of Harry Gold and his co-workers uh, in the early 1950s. Uh, and uh, what we're seeing here is a significant reduction in heart rate after the intravenous administration of digoxin, but you see that the effect is not instantaneous. The maximal effect, uh, in fact, requires six hours uh, before uh, we can observe uh, that uh, significant slowing of the uh, heart rate uh, in patients with atrial fibrillation. So drug distribution may, in fact, impact the onset of drug action. That is, the rate of drug distribution may impact the onset of drug action. So now, if we want to continue treatment, we have to select a maintenance dose. So what is the principles that applies here? Now, in order to estimate the maintenance dose, we need to understand the concept of elimination half-life and elimination clearance, clearance being the other primary pharmacokinetic parameter uh, we referred to uh, a moment ago. So, simple definition, elimination half-life, the time required for the plasma concentration or the total body stores of the drug to fall to half of the concentration or amount present at some previous time. So a very straightforward definition, but again, uh, half-life uh, applies strictly to drugs that follow first order or exponential kinetics of elimination, and we will come back to this uh, in a moment. So let's look at some simple uh, equations here uh, referring to the half-life, again, assuming first order kinetics of elimination, and the half-life can be estimated then as the product of the natural logarithm of two times the apparent volume of distribution divided by the clearance of elimination for that drug. The first order elimination rate constant can be estimated as the ratio of the natural logarithm of two over the observed half-life. And finally, the elimination clearance can be calculated as the product of K times the apparent volume of distribution. Uh, but in fact, uh, K does not determine clearance. This is one way to estimate the clearance of elimination, uh, but in fact, clearance determines both the half-life and the first order uh, rate uh, constant. Now, Maintenance therapy in the case of digoxin. Now, how much do we need to give in order to maintain that therapeutic level that we were looking for in this case, 1.4 nanograms per ml? Well, we need to estimate how much drug is lost over time. Uh, in this case, uh, it was estimated that one-third of the total body stores of digoxin 
uh, is lost daily. In the case of digoxin, uh, the drug is eliminated primarily via the kidneys. So one third of the total body stores at time zero, uh, namely a quarter uh, or, or rather three quarters of a milligram, uh, uh, one third of that is uh, a quarter uh, of a milligram. So that is the daily loss and that is the loss that has to be replaced on a regular basis. So that's how you uh, establish what your maintenance dose uh, should be. Uh, now you may start treatment without giving a loading dose and this is a brute force demonstration of the fact that drug accumulation will take place, will take place uh, over time uh, until you reach or approach a plateau uh, after seven doses in this example you're pretty close to that uh, total body storage of 0.75 milligrams that was established by giving uh, a loading dose. Uh, so drug accumulation will take place uh, exponentially when you have a constant dosing rate for maintenance and you have first order kinetics of elimination uh, for the drug. Now there is uh, another approach of course to estimate the extent of drug accumulation using this accumulation factor uh, that is shown here. Uh, this uh, parameter uh, tau is the dosing interval, the dosing interval. I mean, in the case of our example, it was 24 hours or one day. Uh, and then, of course, you need to know uh, or have an estimation of the elimination rate constant, the first order elimination rate constant uh, for uh, that drug. Now, you can find the derivation of this and other equations in uh, your uh, textbook. And uh, once again, the elimination rate constant that we uh, showed as in the equation for the accumulation factor estimated as a natural logarithm of 2 divided by the uh, elimination uh, half-life. Now, let's see graphically what happens in three different situations here. Uh, the first one is that no digitalizing dose, no loading dose was administered, and the drug is accumulating exponentially until it reaches a plateau. The solid line here is, would be a situation where a loading dose was administered to establish a therapeutic level quickly, and then the optimal uh, maintenance dose was administered uh, over a period of time. Actually, the maintenance dose here is the same as the maintenance dose here. Now, let's say that you gave a higher loading dose, twice the loading dose you gave before, but then administer the same maintenance dose that was used here and here. Over a period of time, the concentration that will be achieved at the plateau or when steady state is achieved is the same. So this illustrates the fact that the loading dose does not determine what the concentration is going to be at steady state. And now we're illustrating another useful uh, uh, estimation, namely that 90% of the steady state level uh, with continuous uh, drug administration will be achieved in approximately 3.3 half-lives for that particular drug. Now, practically, uh, think about an individual with normal renal function that is receiving a quarter of a milligram of the dioxin for maintenance and approaches the plateau concentration in approximately seven days as we saw in our example. Now think of an individual with uremia, uh, impaired renal function 
and consequently impaired elimination of the dioxin. The drug will accumulate, again using the same maintenance dose, and you will anticipate that the plateau concentration is going to be double if the clearance of elimination, say, is reduced by 50%. But the other thing that is important is to recognize that you will not reach the plateau in the patient with impaired renal function until later. Uh, this is normal renal function, normal half-life for digoxin. This is impaired renal function and a prolonged half-life for digoxin. Consequently, you will not achieve that steady state concentration until later in this case, uh, in this example, uh, until 14, 14 days of dosing uh, have uh, taken place. So, now let's discuss clearance as a primary parameter in pharmacokinetics. And of course, uh, we uh, need to understand clearance in the context of drug evaluation and use uh, in uh, clinical medicine. Now, this is the traditional creatinine clearance equation that you uh, learn in your physiology uh, courses uh, that describes the clearance of creatinine. This is an endogenous product that can be measured in plasma and the clearance of creatinine being used as an index of renal function. And we have this relationship here that says that U times V over P uh, determines uh, what the creatinine clearance is uh, in that uh, context. So U refers to the urine concentration of the drug, uh, or rather of creatinine in this case. Uh, v is the urine volume produced over a period of time. Typically, the creatinine clearance requires a 24-hour urine collection. So this is really uh, a, a urine uh, formation rate. And then P standing for plasma concentration of creatinine. Now, uh, let's look at this again and think about the appearance of creatinine in the urine, the rate of appearance of creatinine in the urine, DE, think about excretion of creatinine, DE over DT. Uh, and now this is uh, equal to the clearance for creatinine and the plasma concentration at that time. So uh, again, uh, that equation that we had before uh, is really uh, a differential equation in this guise. Uh, now th let's think about the rate of change of creatinine in the body, X being the amount of creatinine in the body. So we have dx over dt now being equal to I, I being the rate of creatinine synthesis, this is an endogenous product, minus the clearance of creatinine times the uh, plasma concentration. This would be the creatinine uh, excretion rate. At steady state, uh, we can of course, discard this term, the x over dt, such that the plasma concentration now is equal to the rate of creatinine synthesis or is directly proportional to the rate of creatinine synthesis and inversely proportional to the rate of uh, creatinine clearance. Uh, and let's look at these steady state equations because this is truly uh, some of the most useful uh, equations you're going to use in pharmacokinetics. So if we look at continuous synthesis of creatinine, the steady state plasma concentration of creatinine uh, equals the endogenous rate of production of creatinine over the clearance. And if you think about a drug that is being given continuously, say by intravenous infusion, the steady state concentration 
is going to be equal to the infusion rate uh, over the elimination clearance for that drug. So again, one of the most useful equations for you to keep in mind uh, in uh, addressing uh, what are the determinants of the steady state concentration uh, of the drug. Uh, now, <clears throat> we don't often do creatinine clearance determinations and collect urine for 24 hours, and a number of equations have been developed over the years to estimate the clearance of creatinine in the case of the Cockcroft and Gold equation that has been in use uh, since the 1970s. And you have these parameters here uh, that consider age, that consider weight of the individual, and of course, the serum creatinine concentration in milligrams per deciliter. Now this estimate, uh, based on the Cockcroft and Gold equation, has to be reduced by 15% for women, uh, because generally they have a smaller uh, body mass, uh, uh, specifically skeletal muscle, uh, mass, and that leads to a reduced uh, uh, estimate uh, for uh, women uh, when using uh, this approach. Now, in this equation, or rather in this slide, uh, what you see is that the terms that are shown in red are actually estimating the creatinine synthesis rate that we had in our basic equation. Uh, previously. Uh, an example of the importance of relying on the estimated clearance of creatinine as opposed to simply measuring a serum concentration of creatinine is illustrated in this uh, work by Pirges and colleagues uh, in the early uh, 90s. Uh, they had a group of individuals that were clinically toxic uh, due to uh, 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 the use of, of the joxing. And what they were trying to see is what was the uh, uh, clearance of creatinine in these patients as opposed to the serum uh, concentration of creatinine. And they grouped their patients into individuals that had creatinines in serum of 1.7 milligrams per deciliter or less, or individuals that had uh, greater than 1.7 milligrams per deciliter of creatinine. And these are their estimated clearances of creatinine uh, using the Cockcroft and Gold equation. What you see here is that in the group of individuals with uh, low serum creatinine concentration, relatively low serum creatinine concentration, 19 individuals, 19 individuals out of 23 actually had an estimated clearance of creatinine that was less than 50. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the uh, 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 majority of individuals uh, with uh, creatinine in serum greater than 1.7 had a clearance of creatinine less than 50. So once again, it is important to estimate the clearance uh, of creatinine. Now another approach to estimating renal function is based on uh, this equation, the MDRD equation, uh, many versions, that actually estimate the glomerular filtration rate, not the creatinine clearance, but the glomerular filtration rate uh, normalized to body surface area. Now you're going to have more discussions of this equation uh, in electric addressing pharmacokinetics alterations in patients with uh, renal disease. Uh, a more modern equation is the CKD epi collaboration equation uh, that is more accurate than the MDRD equation in, estimator, in estimating the uh, glomerular filtration rate and actually has less bias if the GFR is greater than 60 milliliters per, meeting, per minute, rather, uh, once again normalized 
uh, to uh, body uh, surface area. So back to our steady state uh, equations, if you have a continuous drug infusion, the steady state concentration uh, is a function of the infusion rate and the clearance of elimination for the drug. If you're using intermittent dosing, say giving the drug once a day or twice a day or whatever the case may be, this is the estimated mean serum concentration over that dosing interval uh, now being equal to the dose over the uh, dosing interval and again over the uh, uh, clearance of elimination uh, for the drug. So the steady state concentration, let us emphasize, it is not determined by the loading dose. Now once again, some drugs require the administration of a loading dose to establish a therapeutic concentration rapidly. But the loading dose does not determine what the steady state concentration will be with continuous administration of the drug. Now, the mean steady state concentration with intermittent drug administration uh, is not determined by the volume of distribution. But on the other hand, we need to pay attention to peak and trough levels because they will be affected by the apparent volume of distribution. <clears throat> uh, and this is shown in this example uh, where the volume of distribution is either large or small and uh, the same uh, dose being administrated, administrated uh, uh, over a dosing interval and you see the variations in peaks and trough uh, but the mean estimated uh, concentration over the dosing interval uh, is the same and corresponds of course to that uh, dosing rate and the elimination clearance. And uh, an important element to uh, highlight is that changes in maintenance dose for most drugs when we're dealing with first order kinetics of elimination result in directly proportional changes in the steady state concentration once again for most drugs that follow uh, first order kinetics of elimination. Uh, and uh, we are re-emphasizing our steady state equations because truly these are equations you should remember because of their conceptual and practical use. But some drugs are not eliminated by first order kinetics and I'm giving you three examples here, phenytoin, ethyl alcohol, and aspirin, acetyl salicylic acid. These are drugs that deviate from the general pattern of first order kinetics of elimination. And let's focus on phenytoin. <clears throat> phenytoin undergoes metabolism in the liver uh, via uh, this main pathway of cytochrome P452C9 and we have this parahydroxylated uh, metabolite uh, that is generated through this uh, pathway. And uh, here we have an example uh, uh, actually from uh, Dr. Arthur J. Atkinson Jr. Uh, who had the opportunity to study a patient with uh, phenytoin toxicity. Uh, very high levels of phenytoin observed in this patient uh, upon admission. Uh, and with signs of toxicity, just to give you a reference, the therapeutic range for phenytoin is typically 10 to 20, 10 to 20 micrograms per ml. We're near 60 micrograms per ml when this patient was admitted with signs of toxicity. And what they did uh, in this very elegant study is they followed the plasma concentrations of the drug over time. Uh, and at the same time, they started collecting urine 
uh, to measure the uh, appearance of this uh, parahydroxylated metabolite of phenytoin. And you see here, uh, day after day after day, that the amount of this metabolite of phenytoin that was recovered in the urine remain relatively constant. The plasma concentrations are falling, as you see here, over time, but for a period of time, the amount of the metabolite that appears in the urine is constant. And then we reach a point when the plasma concentrations begin to decline more rapidly, and also we see that the amount of metabolite recovered in the urine also diminishes. What this is indicating, and of course they're, they're measuring urine creatinine to validate their urine uh, uh, collections, if you will, uh, over time. And uh, over here they started re-administering phenytoin once again, and they see the increase in the level and then the subsequent decline of the level. What this indicates is that the metabolic pathway, CYP2C9, that generates this hydroxylated metabolite of phenytoin is saturated, is saturated over a significant period of time because of these very high uh, concentrations of phenytoin uh, that that metabolic pathway cannot handle, uh, if you will. Uh, phenytoin kinetics actually follow the pattern of Michaelis Menten kinetics. Again, uh, concentration over time, uh, in this case given the drug uh, intravenously. Uh, this is the rate of change of phenytoin plasma concentration, which does not follow first order kinetics, uh, represented here, or, or rather uh, determined by the Vmax, that is the maximum capacity of the metabolic pathway, uh, the Michaelis constant, and here again the uh, uh, phenytoin concentration terms. So this is a deviation from uh, first order kinetics of elimination. So let's look again at our, our steady state equations. Uh, we're given the drug, uh, a drug if you will, at intervals orally and this is the equation we described before for drugs that follow first order kinetics. Uh, clearance of elimination times the mean uh, steady state concentration. Uh, in the case of drugs that follow Michaelis Menten kinetics like phenytoin and ethyl alcohol and aspirin, uh, you need to apply this equation and this term, if you will, uh, in lieu of this uh, clearance of elimination uh, term. A very important issue because when you follow this type of kinetics, you lose the element of dose proportionality. Here, the patient receiving 300 milligrams per day of any toin has a concentration of 10 micrograms per ml in plasma. Again, the mean steady state concentration. We go up to 400 milligrams and the concentration already doubles. We go to 500 milligrams per day, we have tripled the concentration of any toin. So we do not have dose proportionality uh, with drugs that follow uh, Michaelis Menten kinetics uh, of elimination. And, and again, this is another example of a patient that became toxic on a phenytoin dose of 300 milligrams per day, uh, a typical dose, if you will, but excessive in the case of this individual with slower uh, rate of metabolism. Uh, that defining the therapeutic dose then for this patient should really be 200 uh, milligrams uh, per day. And uh, one thing of course that uh, arises as a question is well there is a large number of drugs that are metabolized in the liver. Uh, so an enzymatic pathway is involved and yet we do not see 
Michaelis Menten kinetics uh, for those drugs. So we have apparent first order kinetics of elimination. Uh, and uh, what we can see here is that in situations where the KM, the Michaelis Menten constant for that particular drug and that enzyme, is much greater than the plasma concentrations that we will need or observe uh, in a therapeutic context in the clinic, if the KM is much greater than C, then we can neglect this term here in the denominator such that now we have Vmax over KM becoming uh, a pseudo first order uh, rate constant of elimination. So the ratio of two constants, of course, is a constant. So now this becomes the equivalent term, if you will, under conditions in which the KM for that drug and that enzymatic pathway is much greater than the uh, concentrations that we need to obtain uh, for a therapeutic uh, response. So I will refer you to the practice problems that are uh, provided at the end of chapter two in our textbook uh, with answers provided in appendix two so that you can practice and become comfortable uh, with these concepts. All the equations that I have shown are derived again in the relevant chapters uh, in the textbook. And uh, that will conclude our discussion today. After doing your practice problems and uh, reviewing the lecture material, uh, if you have questions, uh, please contact our course coordinator who will in turn uh, implement a consultation mechanism with the lecturers in the course uh, so that you can get an answer uh, that will be posted. I hope I have provided you with an overview of our discipline, a critical discipline in the context of drug development and in the context of therapeutic drug utilization. Thank you very much.